Hello YouTube, this is Bowtide Media, and today I have episode 3 of the Monster Cat Hot Takes. I asked for your spicy Monster Cat opinions uh, like a month ago now, and so we're finally getting to these videos. Uh, but I'm going to respond to your best, best, quote, best responses uh, in this video here. And if I did not get to your responses, it's because I didn't think they were that great. I'm going to be honest. I'm going to be honest with you. So uh, if you want to be in future videos, my hint of advice is to don't be so narrow in on one specific thing where a lot of people will talk about just an individual song or an individual artist in a very individual time and say like, oh, this song is the worst or this song is better than this song or all that kind of stuff. And so be a little more broad, I would say, and uh, maybe have some spicier takes here and there. I don't know, it's kind of tough to come up with so many different hot takes, but uh, we'll be maybe a little more specific next time, I think. Rock slash metal and EDM fusion tracks, i.e. those from Riot, Boss Fight, Mazare, have produced some of the worst songs on Monster Cat in recent history. It's such an annoying and terrible gimmick. Uh, I, uh, I don't know if you like uh, rock or, or metal then. Um, I don't know if you like those genres of music. Uh, I personally uh, don't listen to a ton of rock or metal and I, I'm a big sucker for these types of tracks. I'm a fan, I like the fusions and so, uh, I just think you don't like those, that style of genre. Ellis often ruins a lot of his tracks with his vocals. His sound design is great, however his lyrics are either so poorly executed and or uninspired slash basic it hurts the song. The only songs with his uh, of his with good vocals are when he or no F aren't responsible for them. You know, I would, uh, I would agree with you at the beginning when I first started listening to Ellis, I thought this stuff was like, like, Speak Francais, I loved the production, but when it came to the vocals, I was like, this is just weird, and I'm not a fan, and ah. But uh, I, nowadays, I freaking love it. I think it's just something fun and cheesy about the songs that are carefree, and I just, um, I, I'm a fan of Ellis now, and, and those kind of silly tracks. Nostalgia removed, 2014 to 2016 was the golden age of Monster Cat. Genuinely, the music is, melo is melodically and sonically leagues ahead of the stuff that releases today. Aside from a few outliners like Kuro, Grant, Coven, and Faint, who are still killing it. Um, can we just, can we all just agree that, th like, that age is just the golden age of Monster Cat? Whatever, the 2016, I think was the main peak of it. Um, can we just agree? I mean, we, we talk about this all the time. There's tons of comments that say, oh, this is the golden age, or this isn't the golden age, or this is the golden age, this isn't the golden age. Just, let's just say it. Let's just say it. It's the golden age. Okay? It's the golden age. Regardless. It, everything about it was, was gold. Karma Field's New Age Dark Age is one of the best albums on the label. It was ahead of its time when it released and received undeserved hatred. If it was released today, people would love it. Uh, I hard agree on this. I didn't love it that much. I didn't give it a ton of attention when it first came out. But now that my taste has evolved and matured, I would say, over time in music, uh, I went back and listened to it and, and boy, whoo, it was a stunner of an album. And uh, I, I do agree. I think if it was released nowadays, I think it would have had a total like cult fan following. Um, so I, I hard agree. The compilation format pre-Uncaged Era was the best. I like the album art at the names for each comp. The 30 songs per comp felt right. Uh, for that time, yes. For the time, yes. But nowadays, the industry has evolved a little bit more, Monster Cat has matured and evolved a little bit more, and for the time, that was great, it was super fun, it felt maybe a little kiddish here and there, but uh, nowadays, Monster Cat knows what it's doing, it's doing a great job at it, and it's evolved with the time, and so it was fun, but those days are over. Silk's going to need to see a chiropractor because they're literally carrying the entire label. What? 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 <laughs> that is a hot take. Uh, no. 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 No, no, no. Silk is not. I don't agree. And I think 99.9% .9 of people would agree with me. Um, I think you're, uh, you're insane. Which, I mean, it is a hot take, so I respect it. AU5's best style was his synthwave style, the encryption and flashback. All of his other songs are good, but are nowhere near them, too. Uh, well, sir, uh, I think you just, uh, I think you just like synthwave style more. I think you just like synthwave a little bit more. Uh, the stuff was good, uh, but I, to say they're nowhere near his other Melodub stuff, I think is, uh, that's a, that's, that's a bold statement to say. I think Hyperpop is cool and appearing on Monster Cat seems like an inevitability. I think that there's no chance that a Monster Cat fan doesn't like Hyperpop, at least in some capacity. Well, 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 uh, I am a Monster Cat fan 
and I do not like Hyperpop. So I hope it doesn't show up on Monster Cat. A majority of bro step ish dubstep on Monster Cat, most notably boss fight stuff, feels very lackluster and uninspired, and I would definitely like to see more unique artists and songs that uh, the area of Uncaged in general needs to step it up because both Silk and Instinct have been producing lots of interesting music. Um, in interesting take here. Uh, I think a majority of people would agree that Instinct, I think, is probably the best of the three kind of sub-labels or brands right now. I like to call them brands because they're not sub-labels. The best of the brands, uh, just because I think, I think Monster Cat sort of trapped themselves a little bit with Uncaged and Instinct, where Instinct is just anything that's more, uh, like, bubbly, I would say, or more pop-oriented. And I just think there's so much more variety in that sphere of music than there is in the heavy stuff in the dubstep, in the drum step, in the drum and bass. I just think there's there's less variety in the uncaged than there is in instinct, and even less so in silk. And so I think I think sort of Monster Cat just trapped themselves a little bit, so I don't think it's really their fault. Um, I, I mean, I guess, uh, I just, maybe because they have such a re defined uh, niche or style of that uncaged music, because like, they're not doing rhythm. Like Monster Cat really isn't doing like bass music or like rhythm style stuff, which is really popular with uh, other labels in the industry. And so I think they're kind of staying away from that. And so that's why I think it doesn't feel as unique because labels do that so well already. Lucas, On My Own, is one of the most obnoxious songs on Monster Cat. I even prefer some Neelio songs over it. Um, okay, I'm, I'm, I made this one, I put this one on the list just because um, I mentioned last time that Neelio by Obsession was horrible. And uh, many of you made comments about Neelio Obsession and how other songs were worse or better than it. Uh, and so first of all, I'm actually a fan of On My Own. I think it's a pretty banger song. It's just kind of a fun, careless trap song. Uh, but Neelio songs, I think, are garbage for the most part. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, I, mainly, I mainly chose this one because um, please just stop saying individual stuff. Uh, stop saying like, this song is better than this stuff and this stuff is better than this stuff. And like just in, in general, or sorry, in very um, small things, like it just one song about one song or one artist about one song and one time frame and stuff like that. So just be a little more broad with your hot takes is all I'm going to say. Monster Cat should have never split into two channels for Uncaged and Instinct. Should have been between two playlists under the same channel and a third with the addition of Silk. Huh. I haven't actually heard this before. That's an interesting idea. That really is an interesting idea. You can still do the thumbnails differently. You can still make everything branded differently. Huh. That is an interesting idea. But I, I think, I understand it. I, I, I get why the channel split. I think it makes, I think it does make more sense in the end because they feel like different ecosystems. And so it would just be like, a, uh, let's take the, the non really Monster Cat listener, for example. They may uh, want to subscribe to the Instinct stuff and just see that because that's what they want to listen to and not just an EDM genre as a whole. And so, I get the different channels. I, I really do. I feel like the label has been making the wrong decisions regarding its evolution throughout time. I understand that as a business, wanting to go big and focus on names and popularity of artists, obviously a no-brainer, but I feel like the community has been shoved aside for the most part. I definitely feel as if the label doesn't really care much about the community and is only focused on pumping out music as a hyper-accelerated rate, which is great. Don't get me wrong, but I just it just feels so forced, and the love for the music doesn't feel it's uh, dissipated. Uh, a good example of this fact is that Uncaged 11 is going to have a gargantuan amount of songs. Um, yeah, at the point of filming this, I have no idea. Uh, Uncaged 11 has, like, what's, like, 60 songs now right now? Like, what the heck? Um, you know what? I kind of agree with you here. I, I do think there obviously is a focus now more of putting a ton of music out there, but um, it does feel like the community is left a little behind, if that makes sense. Uh, like, here's the two best examples. Um... Anniversary number five, or the five-year anniversary, was incredible. They did such a good job of uh, giving hype for it in the community and giving these teasers and uh, just everything about it, of not releasing the songs on Spotify beforehand or not releasing them all at once. And they came out like at on YouTube at the exact same time as like Spotify and SoundCloud, and people were losing their minds figuring out what the next songs were, and it was like, ah, it was so much fun. And, um, and then... 10 year anniversary was just like, ah, here's all the songs at once and they also got leaked earlier and we're not really like pushing it a ton and it just feels more uh, impersonal, I would say. Uh, another thing, I just remember, I think it was Darlington that said uh, when it came to the, uh, 
1,000 song, uh, the 1,000 catalog song, the 1,000th single, uh, the uh, the Smile song, I found a reason. They were like, oh yeah, we're we're not even keeping track of these anymore, or something like that. And they were like, uh, we don't really care about that that much, essentially what they're saying. When the community is like, oh, the thousandth coming up, and what's it going to be? And the hype behind the actual company was just like, not as much as the fans are. And so, uh, I, I would agree with you. I think they're doing a good job of, uh, who is it, Dan, that actually comes and uh, is like the community manager, community person. And so I think they did a, a, a job, an, ad an adequate job, I would say, of actually going to the community and figuring out what they want. But generally, I would say, yeah, I think they don't care about the community maybe as much as they would have. And uh, that's, that's, that's kind of sad for me. I wish artists would stop releasing so many singles before an EP slash LP drops. I get releasing songs to get people hyped, but pardon my pun because Riot is kind of part of it. It gets to be overkill, especially in the cases of Justin O, Sabai, and Cascade. Uh, I'm sorry, but that's just, that's not the way the world works. That's not the way music works. That's, uh, you may have a preference there of wanting it all at once, and I kind of do too to some extent of just doing like a, a full reaction to the full album or something like that, but that's just, that's not the way it works. You gotta get hype for the album, you gotta get the plays on your singles more, you gotta uh, advertise those and market those better, and you wanna have this, the build up to the suspense and stuff, and so, um, I mean, yeah, I... Yeah, that's just the nature of the music industry, so that's not really going to change anytime soon, I don't think. Tut Tut Child's LP is the best album on Monster Cat right now. I'm into it mostly because of the contrast between ambient, nature influence, and heavy rock slash dubstep, which feels like the perfect blend or contrast in Tut Tut Child's style, hence making it my favorite on Monster Cat. Uh, I actually went back and listened to all the LPs fairly recently, all the artist LPs, and um, I think this is the most forgotten LP of all time. So much so that uh, I don't even remember the last last acronym. It's come to the end, and I can't remember the last part without looking it up. I'm, I'm not gonna lie. Uh, and so I'm trying to think about it, but I forget it. Uh, I agree. I think this one is super underrated. Uh, I think nowadays if it was released, it would have been, would have been similar to the New Age Dark Age, which we talked about in the last episode, um, which, yeah, I think it would have gotten a lot more clout then, and um, I'm, I, was a, I was a big fan of it, and so I'm, I would implore you to go back and listen to that Tut Tut Child album. Speaking of artist albums, The Promised Land is far and away the worst album released on Monster Cat. The DNB songs all sound incredibly cookie cutter and like exactly what Muzz has been making for the past like four years. And the non DNB songs are also either completely lifeless or downright insufferable, like Born to This or Sanctuary. Um, I feel like you just don't like Muzz then or his newer style. I, I think you're in definitely, that's. Definitely a hot take because you're you're in the minority here where people, a lot of people really, really liked The Promised Land and myself included. I didn't think it was like the best thing in the world, but I, I thought it was an absolutely solid LP. So um, I think you are in the minority here. And our last one of the day, for the most part, I don't really get the appeal to Note Taker's music. He's released a couple solid tracks in the past, like Infinite and Too Smooth, but it feels like he can't even do his own style very well. He does best when he branches out, but he hardly does it. The production on his songs often feels flat and unimpactful, and doesn't help when, we can, when he can sometimes make long and repetitive music that doesn't really go anywhere. Um, this is an interesting take, uh, mainly because I sort of agree. Uh, for the most part, I've just been like, note takers, like, meh for me. I haven't loved his stuff before, and sometimes I do feel they're a bit repetitive, although I love the atmospheres on his track. Um, but I also wanted to highlight this comment because I think it's, I somewhat agree, but uh, there's a person that I work with in the office that literally listens to note taker stuff. And, like, I was like, what? Like, I'm not gonna, like, this is, <laughs> this is an older adult Chinese woman, like, that just listens to Note Taker. And I'm like, huh? Like, I did not expect that from you at all. And so, yeah. But that has been it for the Monster Cat Hot Takes episode three. Let me know what you guys think of these hot takes in the comment section below. And when it comes time, I will put another post out on socials for you to give more hot takes and hopefully we'll make it a little more uh, specific next time uh, because I think I have a couple fun ideas for more specific hot take episodes. But stay tuned for those. I've been Bowtie Media and I will see you guys in another video.